We're going to listen in tonight on a very contentious debate. It involves an effort by the country's largest Protestant denomination, the Southern Baptist Convention, to convert Jews. Good evening. Welcome to another edition of Larry King Live, a raging debate in the religious community and beyond as the Southern Baptists who are going to gather in Chicago are asking their members to proselytize the faith and to convert Jews. What is up with the Southern Baptists? Ever since the huge denomination got taken over by ultra-conservative fundamentalists, their biggest mission seems to be the conversion of Jews lest they spend eternity in the fires of hell. It's as if Jews have been chosen again, this time not by God, but by the SBC, the Southern Baptist Convention. I must admit that, as a Jew who has never even known a Southern Baptist, it struck me as curious that Baptists were taking such an interest in my welfare. Sometimes it almost seemed as if the Southern Baptists were talking directly to me because, even though my family always celebrated Jewish holidays and I went through the whole bar mitzvah thing, I can't remember ever believing in God. I also can't remember being anything but moderately miserable, and I recently began to take steps to rectify the situation. So I tried many, many, many therapeutic approaches, and I must confess, not with a great deal of success. So after Prozac didn't do anything, he said, well, there's another drug in the same class as Prozac, and maybe we should try that. About the only thing I haven't tried to get me out of my chronic malaise is a reassessment of my spiritual void. If a group with 16 million members is certain that they alone have the key to my happiness and salvation, who am I to argue? I had no choice but take the Southern Baptists up on their offer. The first step in my examination of the case for Christ was to travel to Atlanta in June of 99 to attend the SBC's annual national gathering. Initially it was my hope to convince this man, Paige Patterson, to be my spiritual guide and explain to me why, as a Jew, I'm going to burn in hell. After all, not only is Patterson the president of the SBC, but he was also the architect of the fundamentalist takeover of the huge denomination. Remind some of that is, that our focus across the years has been the conversion of men and women to faith in Christ. One of the great mistakes would be for Americans to believe that that is the only voice of Southern Baptists. Interesting thing on Capitol Hill here, when some of the present leadership come up here and testify before committees and say, speaking for 16 million babies. There's the dumbest congressman on the panel knows that's not so. I mean, he can't speak for his wife, and he sure as heck can't speak for 16 million anybody's. Maybe God was already working for me because just after realizing that it might be a bit too scary to have Patterson as my spiritual guide, I met a 23-year-old protege of Patterson's and knew immediately that I had found the perfect Christian mentor. Ladies and gentlemen, meet Mr. Ben Cole. I, I am a conservative evangelical Christian from the crown of my head to the sole of my feet. Uh, you cut me, I bleed Southern Baptist pretty much. Abortion is nothing short of infanticide and murder. Uh, I believe that Jesus Christ died a penal substitutionary death on the cross to pay for our sins. I believe he was buried literally in bodily form and I believe he was resurrected on the third day literally in bodily form so much so you could have seen the risen Christ in person. Ben is very typical of the kind of uh, young man that comes to our schools and that we like. Um, he, uh, somebody once asked, you know, do you think these young men are going to go to heaven? And we say, uh, well, yes, if they don't run past it. Listen to me, friends. If you don't hear anything else I say to this morning, I want to tell you that every jot and tittle of this word is from God. And when God says something, brother, he means it. I think that homosexuality is an abomination. I could not... Uh... And with a good conscience, be a member of the Democratic Party, and quite frankly, I don't see how any Christian can be. Jesus Christ is the only way of salvation offered by God to man, and one must come to Him through repentance and faith to be converted. They must be born again. Ben believes it takes more than being just a good person to get to heaven. My mother, she may have a relationship with Christ. I, I really just don't know. If I were to ask Ben if he thought his 
whether or not his mother was going to heaven, what do you think he would say? He would say no. I believe Ben would say no. In September of 99, I set out for the Dallas area where Ben would be working towards his divinity degree at Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Fort Worth. As always, I brought along Stephen Schmidt, my trusty cameraman and a Fulbright scholar from South Africa. Steve, one of the things that I think we're going to have to do when we get down there is, uh, is figure out who our production assistants are going to be. Do you have experience working on uh, films at all? Not at all. Tell me what you think about Southern Baptists. I think they're a strict bunch of racists. Over the years, I've come to rely on Schmidt not just for his camera work, but as a sage sounding board to help see me through even the most challenging dilemmas. Do you have any feelings about the type of PAs that you want? Well, out of that 15, at least half of them are going to be psychopaths. Son, come sit on Grandpa's lap. Come on over here, boy. The big part of the task is to weed out the crazy ones. I have, a, I have a feeling I was drowned in a past life. At any rate, with or without sane production support, it would be here, Dallas, Texas, where I'd either accept the gospel message and find salvation, or reject Jesus and find myself, as far as fundamentalist Christians are concerned doomed to an eternity in the fires of hell. I was saved as a nine-year-old boy. My parents had divorced, and um, I was living with my father. He just had a lot, of, a lot of problems, and lots of those problems, you know, filtered down to his nine-year-old son, exposure to, to sin. I can tell you, when I was nine years old, all I could think about was wanting to get God's forgiveness for how sinful I was. I realized I was disobedient. I realized, you know, um, I had unclean thoughts. I knew I was guilty before God. Um, as a sinner. I, I remember that very clearly. And, and, and weeping, uh, knowing that, you know. How were you a sinner? What did you do? You were only nine years old. Well, yeah, but a nine-year-old can sin. Christians owe a lot. Baptists in particular owe a tremendous amount to the Jewish people. So the way you were showing your love to the Jewish people was by, by saying that we're going to make them, we want to make them not Jewish. We want to make them Christian. Well, that's fallacious. I'm not out to make anybody not a Jew. A Jew who comes to recognize Jesus Christ as the Messiah is, is a fulfilled Jew. So it would be the Southern Baptist desire in an ideal world to bring every Jew to Jesus so that Judaism as we know it today would fail to exist. Well, um... Well, it's something that certainly doesn't bring me any pleasure to say. Um, that anyone uh, who at the moment of death, uh, either ignorantly or uh, willingly, uh, has rejected Jesus Christ as uh, their Lord and Savior, will spend eternity in a Christless hell, a place of eternal torment and suffering. Physical? Physical. The alternative being what? heaven, eternity with Christ, um, forever and ever and ever. If I knew I was right and that the people who were with Jesus were going to heaven, I don't know if I would be that interested in trying to get everybody else in the whole world to come and join me there. Because I've been crowded in New York in this little apartment all my life. And I might want some space. Did you say that the, the body will either rise or rise to heaven or descend to hell? Right. We'll, we will be there uh, either in heaven or hell uh, with a body. Well, as far as I know, if, uh, if we go and, and, and dig up uh, some true Christians who have died, it's likely that we will find some remains of that person's body in his grave. Sure. So it's not his earthly body that's that's going wherever it, to heaven. Well, one day that earthly body will be raised. Uh, the bones? The what? bones themselves, yeah. If you never get to that, that point uh, and you just linger in this poverty of spirit and a misery over it, you'll be the most miserable man 
uh, on the face of the earth for the rest of your life and twice, infinitely more so in eternity. God took Jesus Christ, His only Son, He put Him on a cross, and He allowed Him to suffer the penalty for every sin of every man uh, and every woman who would ever believe. Lovingly, I say to you, you know, um, uh, or ask you rather, you know, do you reject that you're a sinner? If thinking of myself as not the best person I can be is equivalent to being a sinner, then I'm a sinner. What if I just recognize that I'm a sinner and do my best not to do it anymore? It's not possible to, to stop, for you to stop. Um, you even know, after I'm saved. Well, right. Uh, the, even the best man on his best day is a sinner. So where do we go? Where do we go from here? You've made the first step, you know, if we call it, we're breaking up into steps, by confessing that you're a sinner. Uh, you need God to forgive you. And uh, you spoke about wanting peace in, li peace in life. Well, that's where peace begins. Just know that there's danger involved. And the danger is uh, that opportunity brings accountability uh, before God. So you're saying that if I consider Jesus but never bring him into my life repeatedly, that, that somehow that makes things worse for me? It does. This very moment, if you sought uh, forgiveness with all your heart and cried out to God who loves you and cares for you and by faith accepted the payment for your sins that Jesus Christ paid on the cross and by faith accepted that God raised him from the dead. The Bible says uh, you will be saved. Yeah. I, I just want to get started and I, I think once I get into it I'll, I'll, I'll feel it more and understand more and, and yeah. get me started. Um, you're telling me that right now at this very moment you want to commit your life to Christ. I can't say that I'm ready to proclaim Jesus Christ as my personal Lord and Savior yet. I want to begin to understand sure. a little bit better. Then, then, you're not then you're not ready to be saved yet. Um, but I, but I, I will tell you this. Uh, I mean, the, the best thing I know that we need to do um, is uh, I do want to pray for you. Is that all right? Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your word, and I thank you how you teach me uh, your word and ways to communicate your word. Lord, I thank you for Steve. Lord, I don't know what your plans are for him. And I don't even know if uh, you desire for either one of us to live through the night. But Lord, whatever it is that you desire to do through me and to do in Steve's life, I pray that you would have free reign that not only is Steve saved, but so are those many people who will see uh, his life transformed by the power of Jesus Christ working in his life. You pray what's ever on your heart. Um, I don't know what's on your heart. If you're comfortable doing that. If you're I'm, not... I'm not comfortable, but I think that I have to start. Well, uh, then I tell you, the best thing you can do is, uh, is just, ask, just ask God um, uh, to begin the process. Uh, let me give it a try. Lord, I've never prayed before in my life. Uh... I've always doubted your existence. I've lived my life for myself. And I have an emptiness inside me that I don't like, that I would like to fill. I'd like to work towards feeling more complete. And I will talk with you again soon, I hope. Amen. I know I'm going to be good at this. I could be a Texan. I could be a Christian.
we cannot become a communist state um, as long as uh, the NRA is out there and Charlton Heston's passing out ammo. Steve, you got to get behind me, I think. Yeah, yeah I'm behind you. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> um. Good shot. You got to cock it. So I hit him pretty, pretty, pretty solid. I would have taken a face off. All right. He was a young man. Ironically, not long after Ben made me understand why the possession of high-powered instruments of death is the inalienable right of Americans, a psychopath named Larry Ashbrook shot up Wedgwood Baptist Church in Fort Worth. Are you feeling forgiveness for this government? Yeah, I feel that he was a man that Satan had a hold of. We don't like what happened. We don't have to like what happened, but we love the people. How do you feel about what happened tonight, and does it change your feelings at all about guns? Well, no, I wish I'd have been there and had one. <laughs> we could have saved a lot of damage had somebody been there and had one, you know. I promised myself that I'd have an open mind about why Jesus is, as the Bible says, the way, the truth, and the life. But despite Ben's best efforts, I just didn't get it. You know, look, find a chapter in the Gospel of John and read it every day. Commit to read it every day for a month and pray before you read it, Lord, if you are real, reveal yourself to me during this time. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Did he look differently? She turned around and saw him. I have a question. It's one thing for a book to describe a historical action, something that happened. But when uh, a book that was written, let's say, 50 years after the fact, quotes an angel, it's harder for me to, uh, to believe that. Considering the case for Christ in Dallas has its advantages because if at first you don't succeed, there's an endless supply of alternatives to help you try, try again. For instance, Ben thought it would be helpful for me to speak with a professor he knew at the seminary because, like me, he was once an atheist but has since become not just a believer but a biblical inerrantist. I didn't choose Christianity because it was easy. I, I chose it because it's the truth. You've got to choose a religious lifeguard who has demonstrated that he has conquered death, hell, and the grave. Now, it doesn't take a brain surgeon to figure out where things are. It just takes a simple religious survey. Buddha, six feet under. Muhammad, six feet under. Joseph Smith, six feet under. Elvis, here little buddy. I mean, you just go through. Jesus, are you there? The angel said, he is not here. He is risen indeed. I personally do not believe that there is extraterrestrial life. And uh, one of the main reasons is, is because the Bible says when Jesus comes back a second time, that he will destroy the universe with fire and everything will be remade, a new heaven and a new earth. This would not be very fair to some alien that perhaps is as intelligent as us, looks just like uh, you know a lizard. And can you imagine he's at Lizard Little League? and all of a sudden everything gets destroyed by fire. Well, that's not fair. After making no headway with Dr. Harbor, I took advantage of my proximity to the First Baptist Church of Dallas, widely recognized as the flagship Southern Baptist Church in the country. In return for attending services at First Baptist one Sunday, I was visited the next night by a trio of well-wishers headed by the church's chief of evangelism. We're here returning your visit. Good to see you. Come on in. Whoa. The only way you're ever going to make that step is, it's, is to take that step. And if it doesn't work, then, you know, just give him an opportunity. 
I hate to say this, knowing your background, but Hitler. What if Hitler was saved? Would he go to heaven? Yes. So you want me to, to say a prayer? No. If that's what God wants you to do, that's what I want you to do. If that's what you'd like to do in your heart, that you're willing to, to receive the risen and resurrected Christ into your life as your Savior, willing to receive Him as your Lord, and you're, you have a desire to, to turn and go the way God would want you to go. And then what, what I want to do is, is lead us in a prayer. We can, just, we can tell God that. Is that, is that okay? Yeah, I'd like to, um, to um, have him talk to me to lead me in that direction. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, uh, that's what I'm praying for. Okay. I don't feel like in my heart that I can honestly make the full commitment right now. All right. That's fair. That's fair. Lord, how we thank you for this time together with Stephen and his friend. And um, I just want to make a pause right here. May I? Excuse me. Lord, excuse me. Tell me your first name again. Stephen. Stephen. Two Stephen. Stephen. Two Stephen. Okay. I, have you, you know, you've been right there as kind of a silent partner with Stephen here, but has what uh, you heard made sense to you? Absolutely. Is that right? Um, well, Stephen, would, would you like to receive the gift of eternal life? Um, I'm sort of working along in the same kind of fashion. Is that right? Yeah. Um, well, would, I want to invite you to... to uh, well, you could definitely pray for him. To pray with us. I'll pray <laughs> along with you guys. Really? Okay. I will. All right, all right. Well, I'm going to lead us in a prayer, okay? And um, let's just say this, okay? I don't want... Just understand that what I'm doing right now, I'm not, I'm not putting words in your mouth, okay? I want to be very sensitive to this uh, for you and for Stephen. But, um, but why don't, why don't, let's, let's, let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus. Dear Lord Jesus. I ask that you come into my life. I ask that you come into my life and be my Savior. And be my Savior. And be my Lord. And be my Lord. I ask that you forgive me of my sin. I ask that you forgive me of my sins. And I thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. And I thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for forgiving me. And thank you for giving me eternal life. And thank you for giving me eternal life. Through your resurrection. Through your resurrection. Help me to live this life. Help me to live this life. I cannot live it alone. I cannot live it alone. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for saving me. That, that, that's, that's, that's insane. That's not what it means to follow Jesus, is to say a f formula or, or, or to say some predigested words. It means taking the life of Jesus seriously and trying to emulate uh, how Jesus related. To Can you imagine Jesus treating somebody like that? I can't. When I came prepared, you know, uh, I want to give both of you something, okay? This is a spiritual birth certificate. You're born once physically. You're born the second time spiritually. So uh, today, uh, Stephen, would be your spiritual birthday. This is a spiritual birth certificate. When's your physical birthday? Christmas. Really? Wow. Salvation simply becomes uh, some sort of mechanistic process. He got you to do something. He filled out a certificate. Let's go on to the next Jew and convert him or her. Uh, and my evangelism is done. And, and that's pretty shabby. At our house, what we do is we have, our boys know when they did this, they know the exact date, and we always have like a spiritual birthday party mm -hmm. for them. And we have a little cake and everything. The member of a cult is convinced that he or she has a kind of a special road to truth or to God. Now, this is not your ticket to heaven. You do not have to have it on you if you were to, you know, die. 
This is something because like sometimes, let me tell you something, the enemy, the devil is going to cause you to doubt. He's going to cause you to question. But you can look at this and you can say on that day, I settled that in my heart. Well, I think the people who try to uh, convert you and bring you to Jesus have been through that process of indoctrination and brainwashing. Do that. Yeah, tell this me about this. So what is this? That's brie. Tell me about yeah, brie right. cheese. <laughs> you don't know yeah, brie those cheese? Are bite size. That's what this is yeah, supposed to be like. Jewish that. cheese. Not though. Jewish. I know. I just wanted to say It's that. French. <laughs> it's spreadable. That is delicious. <laughs> Whoa, that is good. what the Bible says first of all we believe God said it but we don't believe he meant it and so when prayer meeting comes around brother we just flip back our easy boy pop open our Cheetos and tell Big Mama we're tired and can't go to church though I wasn't about to forsake Cheetos for church my respect for Ben's approach to spreading the gospel grew exponentially after my encounters with the extraterrestrial professor and the evangelist with the birth certificates I found myself wishing that Ben wasn't such a Bible thumper because I got a great kick out of him when he wasn't going on about the Bible being the error-free word of God. I don't know any stories about uh, death row inmates who, who become <laughs> Jews. Who decide so. to get bar mitzvah food. <laughs> yeah. Their last request was for kosher food. <laughs> Surprisingly, the more I got to know Ben, the more it became obvious that he actually was having a rough time balancing his Bible thumping facade with his innate nature that's clearly, well, devilish. I think that there's a lot of th sinful things that, alleged so-called sinful things, that you would really like to do because of your nature. Listen to you. Uh, I think I'm talking with Satan himself. And there are times when, uh, when Ben uh, has uh, been uh, inappropriate in, in the uh, uh, timing and the direction of his remarks. It started off with little things, like Ben telling me that I shouldn't put goop in my hair because it made me look like a Mexican. Then he made some rather interesting remarks about his cinematic preferences. There are so many things you can learn from the Godfather movies that I put into practice in ministry, and it's kind of scary that it works, you know. It also seemed clear to me that Ben was having a heck of a time controlling his lust. And the Bible does clearly say that lust is a sin. Now, I've got no problem with lust, but then again, my life doesn't revolve around the claim that every word of the Bible is true. I think you're a very attractive young girl. I, I think, I think y'all are some very, uh, very attractive young ladies. Jesus Christ. The interesting thing is that, because of the sinfulness of lust, Ben was forced to take the dubious approach of cloaking his flirtation behind the dissemination of the gospel message. If you were to die tonight, you're absolutely certain that you would go to heaven. Most definitely. Absolutely certain. And if you were to get to heaven and God would ask you, why should I let you in, what would you say? Because he's my Lord and Savior. That's a good answer. That's a good answer. Because who's your Lord and Savior? Jesus Christ. Amen. Ben's M.O. with women hit an uncomfortable snag when he found himself surrounded by a group of less-than-pure sorority sisters from SMU. Are you a virgin yourself? I have uh, totally saved myself uh, for my wife uh, for marriage, absolutely. How are people who are having premarital sex, how can they be saved? Are any of y'all married? No. Nobody here is married, then yeah. guess what? It's a sin for you to be having sex. Let's say some guy never gets married, then is it a sin for him to masturbate? I don't know of one person that has said that they've never had a guilty conscience uh, after that act. Sex outside of marriage is sin. But what about inside marriage? Like, is that just What's off do limits? whatever you want? What's off limits? Uh, well, I know when I get married, uh, there will probably be a lot more on limits than off limits. Um, but there will certainly be off limits. You know, there are some things which are just wicked. There are some things which are just which are just pagan. Like S and N, like anal sex. Like I I don't want to go into specifics. But the most disturbing manifestation of Ben's conflict between his devilish nature and his position as a biblical inerrantist is his propensity to rat on so-called liberals, those who may not believe every single word of the Bible in an effort to see them removed from any positions of substance within the SBC.
But my, my goal isn't to uh, ruin them at all. Matter of fact, my goal is to uh, is restorative. I think they need to. Uh, I think they need to be brought low that they can be exalted. Interesting little thing tonight. Uh, ben asked me if we'd been recording phone conversations, and I said no. We don't have the appropriate equipment. And he said, Well, I have. Well, I tell you, I will be honest with you. When you first got here, I was trying to keep tabs on wherever you went, whoever you talked to, and all those kind of stuff. That lasted about a week. I realized, okay, that's absurd. <laughs> were, were you able to do it? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but it was taking up too much of my time. Name three people who you think Ben is completely at peace with and has nothing critical to say about. Um, Paige Patterson, uh, Judge Pressler, and... It didn't take long to realize that Ben's liberal ousting crusade is fueled, at least in part, by his devotion to SBC President Paige Patterson, a man whose legacy may well be his lifelong mission to eradicate liberals from the denomination. Uh, I would have to say in all candor that there are some faculty members remaining in a couple of the seminaries that, um, uh, oh well, shall we say, um, uh, I wouldn't uh, be heartbroken when they go ahead and retire. Paige uh, Patterson has been on a crusade to uh, find uh, liberalism in every uh, relationship he's been in. I know all of the conservative leaders of the controversy, and I knew their parents, um, who I might add were not as abrasive as they are. The professor that actually helped him finish his degree, he was, as I understand it, having trouble completing his doctorate, and the professor that nurtured and, and led him uh, through that program to its completion, I even have a feeling he might not have done it had it not been for this uh, professor's personal attention, was one of those that Page uh, very bitterly and, uh, and boldly uh, critiqued as a, as a liberal. But I've known Page for years. Is he abrasive? Yes. And he knows that, and he cultivates that. I told him one time, I said, Paige, when you go out to meet the Lord, uh, to me it's not going to be especially happy to say to him, look what I did with my life, my ministry. I found this book, and here's what a professor said. Look at here what, what he did here and what he said there. I said, that's a pretty, uh, pretty petty, pretty uh, shallow uh, effort uh, that you're involved with. While I was in Texas, the fundamentalist's primary liberal target was a widely admired professor at the seminary who refused to walk in lockstep with every radical decree of the SBC. I have an Australian sheepdog named uh, Dammit, and uh, I call the dog Darnit on Sundays. Well, I thought that'd be funny for a Baptist pastor to have a, a dog named that. But for 14 years, my dog has generated more conversation about uh, the integrity of who I am and whether I should be teaching here than my, my beliefs often have. These liberals who are in positions of leadership in our seminaries uh, need to be, uh, they ought to be fired before midnight. Not because I want to ruin their lives or, or uh, somehow make their children starve or go hungry, you know, that would be ruining them, but because I want them to repent. There seems to be less and less room for people like me to still be part of the family and to have a differing point of view. And that's very sad to me. They must have a perceived enemy. That's what gives them uh, reason for being. It's so silly and it's so anti-Christian in terms of the way I think Christians ought to act and treat each other. And, and before God, I want to say that I can differ with another person, but my differing does not mean I want to destroy them. The tactics, certainly, where they accomplish uh, their ends by any means possible, like spying and, and uh, attacking and so on, the, the tactics are not ethical. I would be damned if I let anybody take the joyful faith that I have found in the relationship with Jesus Christ away from me because I don't use the right words and I don't march in step to what they want me to believe. Not realizing at the time how fervent the fundamentalists were to see this good Christian terminated, I naively mentioned to Ben that Professor Dickens told me that the situation at the seminary had become so oppressive that he didn't know if he could take it anymore. Is there any way that you could be ratted on? 
somewhere down the line? Steve, uh, Manning, uh, this is Doug Dickens. I would like to chit-chat with you a little bit, probably not tonight since I'm home. But I am uh, a little confused about something and a little concerned about why it happened. Uh, the student that we spoke of that in my class, your guide, uh, came up to me tonight and told me that you had said to him that I was definitely leaving uh, the seminary. Dickens probably believes now that Ben is sitting in our apartment scrolling through his uh, interview and writing down notes to present to the fucking dean. That's what I think in Dickens' position. But let me put it this way, you've been an invaluable resource on, for me on Dickens. The whole thing about him not being gone led me to find out a whole bunch of stuff. I have a greater love for people since I'm a Christian. Uh, I have a greater patience with people. In addition to proselytizing directly to Jews, the Southern Baptist Convention is also a big supporter, both financially and otherwise, of Jewish believers in Jesus, so-called Messianic Jews. Messianic Jews consider themselves Jewish even though they believe that Jesus, or Yeshua as they call him, is also the Jewish Messiah. Since the case for Christ as presented by fundamentalist Southern Baptists was just not getting through to me, I wondered if I'd finally get it if the message came from these people who, like me, were raised as Jews. As Messianic Jews and believers in Yeshua, we understand that divine forgiveness, forgiveness from God, is most evident and flows from the cross of Yeshua, from his death and from his resurrection. As Holocaust survivors, how did your parents react to your conversion? My aunt mom really reacted. She, she went, almost went into hysteria. And when she calmed down enough to scream words at me, she screamed, Mishchumad, you traitor. You've gone over to Hitler's side. One evening, somebody shared with me about the Lord uh, coming down from a drug-related experience, and I walked away, and I said, wow, this is, this is truth. What I would have to say is that the Spirit of God at that moment fell on me, came on me, and pierced me through the heart. I believe that I got saved that night. Of course, I had a little bit of an experience that night that, that kind of moved me in that direction. This fire started burning right down here, and it just it began to move up and almost ex like exploded out of my head. So are you a Jewish believer in Jesus? Yes, I am. My son led me to the Lord, and while he was witnessing to me, I saw light around his head. I am Jewish by circumcision of the heart. <laughs> what does that mean? Well, you know, as I understand it, the Jewish people go have circumcision to prove uh, their love for their God. Um, we've been taught that the circumcision of the heart is what's important because that pulls the flesh away so that God can come in. Here's the choice. Either is the truth. Or he's a liar, he's a phony, he's a lunatic. That's the choice. The other option is that he's none of those things. And, I mean, Jesus didn't write this. There is the possibility to non-believers that it is not divinely inspired, that it was simply written by men after he died. And he was portrayed in any way that they wanted to portray him. The earliest Christian canonizers, editors, tradents, those who carried the tradition forward, look back to the Hebrew Bible and, and pick the most famous gems of the Bible, Messianic texts, and applied it to Jesus in the full knowledge that that would win more converts. Do you believe that there's a revolutionary war? The American Revolutionary yeah, War? Yeah, do you believe that? Yes. There's nobody around to testify the, to that either. How do you know? Do you believe that Napoleon existed? Do you believe in the conquistadors? Do so you believe that there was a, a, a Christopher Columbus? But you understand the you differences. Don't see, somebody wrote him in a book. How do you know? You know? I don't, but with all of those other uh, historic figures, there's no, 
There's no rising from the dead. There's no touching a, a leper and he's cured. There's no demons jumping out of people. Uh, it's a lot easier for a logical person to fathom. Here's what I'm thinking. Is it something you would accept for me to try this? Even though I still have all of these reservations, or do I have to be without a doubt right now before I make that proclamation that I know it to be the truth? Can I try it? Sure. Sure. Empowered by Robin's assertion that it would be okay for me to give Jesus a try even if I didn't fully believe, I arranged a visit with my new friend Gloria, the woman with this circumcised heart, to see how she'd handle a pilgrim like myself. The Holy Spirit has drawn you, and Yeshua himself has been wooing you because he loves you so much. He says, test me and see. And, and all you do is you ask him. You ask him to come in. You want to pray with me? Okay. Hold my hand. Just say, Yeshua. Yeshua? I believe. I believe. That you died on the cross. That you died on the cross. That you were born of a virgin. That you were born of a virgin. And that you died especially for me. And that you died especially for me. I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm a sinner. But you died. But you died. To atone. To atone. For those sins. For my sins. Yes. And I invite you in. And I invite you in. Into my heart. Now, you didn't in any way dupe me into marrying you just now. <laughs> You've entered into a covenant relationship. If on the way home on the freeway now, uh, a big semi crashes into my van and I'm dead, what's going to happen to me now? I, I will miss you, <laughs> but I will see you again in heaven. Do you know the Word of God says that all of heaven rejoices when one sinner comes? How much more does he rejoice when a Jew <laughs> I guess I have to go back to uh, Baruch Hashem now and uh, receive my congratulations, I suppose, because you know she's going to tell everybody that I'm saved and that she did it. She's Welcome to, to the family of God. You are now my brother for eternity. I think you better take a couple of chill pills. <laughs> <laughs> See if I, could, if I could coerce Steve to come up here. He was on a search for God, and he was on a search for Yeshua to light his life. And this week, uh, he found Yeshua. It just moves me so. Thank when you. one of the chosen choose back. He died for me, and it's like, oh, I can see him dying for someone who is good, but I'm not good. Well, get ready. Satan wants you more than ever now. And he's going to try in all kinds of very, very subtle ways. Once you cross over, he's like, get back over here. I mean, he knows he's lost one of you. Hallelujah! Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, fell just after I was welcomed to the fold at Baruch Hashem, and as fate would have it, the Southern Baptist Convention bid Jews a Happy New Year by circulating, with great national fanfare, a tract explaining how Baptists should approach Jews with the good news of Jesus during this holiest period of the Jewish calendar. What would you say if a prominent rabbi called you up right now and uh, asked for your comment on this latest, the last couple of weeks with this pamphlet yeah. that came from the sure. International Missionary, yeah. Missionary Board. Well, how would you respond to him uh, and his concerns? Well, I'd try to share with him to see that as, a, as a, a manifestation of our love for the Jewish people. You can't love a person until you know what hurts them. Uh, Southern Baptists have never come to the Jewish community, officially or unofficially, at least these Southern Baptists, and said, we love you and we want to know how we can really be true partners with you. If they had known anything about Jewish Christian history, uh, they should have known that this would be offensive. It, it, it's so offensive because it's couched in love. It's couched in, they say that it's because of our respect for Jews, 
I mean, respect Jews, then let them live as Jews. There's a sense in which this, uh, this Christian conversionism means that there are Christians in this world who would prefer that there be no more Jews. It's offensive to be told that you're going to hell or that God doesn't hear your prayers. Right? Uh, is, you, you can't have an open relationship uh, and you can't have mutual respect if you think you've got the whole truth and everybody else is a fool. Apparently the brouhaha surrounding the dissemination of the so-called prayer guide didn't deter the SBC because towards the end of September they continued their evangelical assault on Jews when Paige Patterson co-convened an unprecedented conference with Chosen People Ministries, a major Jews for Jesus-like organization. Ironically, the conference was held at Calvary Baptist Church in New York City, so Schmidt and I had to scoot back home for a couple of days to attend. What are you protesting today here? We're protesting here that there's a conference that's co-convened by the Hebrew Christians and by the Southern Baptist movement. We must be faithful to preach the gospel in season and out of season so that one day with great patience the major harvest will come. It's promised in Scripture, Romans 11, 25, and 26, and all Israel will be saved. What do Jews think about who Jesus was? It's a, it's a huge question. The important question is who Jesus is not. Jesus is not the Jewish Messiah. He's not the savior to the Jewish people. Who's going to be here that you, you consider most problematic? Uh, Paige Patterson. If I were to have come to you and you would have agreed to act as my spiritual guide, how would you present the gospel to me? Would have probably gone, first of all, to Isaiah 53, and I would have walked you through every single solitary verse of the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, which any open mind wanting to understand what the prophet had to say cannot fail to see the clear association of Isaiah 53 with uh, Yeshua. Isaiah 53 has nothing to do with Jesus who came uh, hundreds and hundreds of years later. Paige Patterson has one interpretation of Isaiah 53. There's a Jewish interpretation of I Isaiah 53. While the debate about Isaiah 53 is likely to rage for at least another two millennia, I was more concerned about disappointing the Christian radio station broadcasting from Calvary's lobby that was eager to treat its listeners to the triumphant testimony of a newly saved Jew. We have with us here um, uh, Steve Mannon. He is a documentary filmmaker. And uh, Steve, uh, welcome, first of all. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. What is your spiritual condition at the moment? Well, uh, they, they make uh, quite an interesting case. And uh, I've been listening and uh, trying to understand the... Uh, that side of the, it's, it's very difficult for a Jewish person, I think, who was raised, born and raised Jewish, to, uh, to really understand the gospel, but I'm trying my best and I feel like I'm, I'm understanding that point of view. After the conference, Schmidt and I scurried back to Dallas, only to find that I'd gotten myself into a bit of a jam. We've been ordered by the scriptures now to immerse you, and you have submitted to that in the name of Yeshua the Messiah. Even though I never asked to be saved, both the Baptists and the Messianic Jews thought I was born again simply because I repeated someone else's prayer. The pressure was on to be baptized. And there's nothing anti-Jewish about being baptized. You don't lose a Jewish heritage. John the Baptist was a Jew in the desert baptizing Jews. Jesus himself was a, a Jew who was baptized. And we want to pray for the gift of the Holy Spirit yes. to come upon you in a powerful and supernatural way. Of course I didn't have to get baptized. I could have just said no thanks. I chose to go through with it not to belittle the people who so earnestly tried to make me believe that Jesus is the Jewish Messiah, but because I needed to demonstrate to myself as graphically as possible my disbelief in their case. After all, if all of these zealots are right and all but saved Christians are hellbound, my prospects for a pleasant eternity would be in serious jeopardy if I knowingly went through baptism as a non-believer. Time to dunk?
you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit of the living God. The Southern Baptists haven't learned. They're horse blinded themselves and they can't see the real world. Jesus, Paul, Peter were all Jews. It's their God that we believe in that started this. And the good news was, they said, it's open to Gentiles. I'm a Gentile. They've got it backwards. Do we want to turn America into a battleground of religious faith? And does every group want to convert every other group? I mean, where is that going to lead? I would wish, Steve, that every person in the world were a follower of Jesus. Does that mean I wish everybody in the world would be a Christian? Absolutely not. Because historically, every time Christians or anybody else gets a clear upper hand, what happens? They began to persecute. I think it's a challenge to other, form, uh, other Christians. Is this the kind of Christianity that they want to be normal to Christianity? Are Southern Baptists going to be allowed to dominate and shape the agenda of what Christianity is and is not? God is God, and God can save whomever God pleases. Uh, and I learned that from Jesus, who was Jewish. Is it fair to say that by determining what one's got to do to get into heaven, people like Paige Patterson play God in a way? I think that's a very, uh, a very logical way of looking at uh, supra-fundamentalism. In 1996, uh, a resolution was passed at the New Orleans Convention uh, that suggested that some ener more energy and uh, resources were devoted towards bringing the gospel to the Jewish people. Uh, uh, clearly you were in favor of that resolution. Uh, in hindsight, uh, would you have changed it at all or, or have done it? Done it yes, I, I would definitely have changed one thing. I would have done it much sooner. I grew very fond of most of the Christians I met and envy the peace, love, and joy they find in life through their belief in Jesus Christ. Frankly, I've always craved the happiness and contentment they so easily display. Unfortunately, after considering the case for Christ, it seems I'm just going to have to continue searching elsewhere. As for fundamentalist Christians who feel obligated to foist their religious convictions on those who may not welcome them, I pray they pay a little more attention to their error-free Bible and, at the very least, heed one of Jesus' most popular sayings. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. I mean, I've had an open mind about it. I've you have. A Christian could not ask for a more listening, uh, more trying to understand, uh, witnessing. I'm supposed to get married on December 4th. You are? Yeah. Really? You're engaged? Does she believe it? Uh, no. Well, there are verses in the Bible that talk about being unequally yoked. Unequally yoked? Unequally yoked. Yeah. With this ring, I be wet. Biblically speaking, it does mean you're not supposed to marry knowingly an unbeliever. Really? Mm -hmm. Oh. With this ring, I be wet. Now that I'm going, what do you think of me? I just think you better drop here. Am I still going to hell? Well, I don't think with a smile on my face. I think you better drop here. <laughs>